Now we can dive into the discussion worksheet. Let's start with problem one, multicast. In the first half of this problem, we'll be using DVMRP multicast. And in the second half of this problem, we're using CVT, core base tree multicast. So starting with part one here, we're told that D, H, and J are members of a multicast group M. So we have D, H, J that are all members of group M. And we're also told that C wants to send a packet to this group. So C is our send. Now notice here that C wants to send to the group, but is not a member of the group. Um, so in multicast, non-members can also send to the group. You don't have to be a member to be able to send to the group. The question we ask you is, what path does this packet take to reach H? There's a couple of approaches to this problem. The most tempting approach uh, is probably to just apply the steps of DVMRP as I taught in the introductory uh, video and as Scott talked about in lecture, and just sort of apply the rules to see what tree is built. So we could do that. Uh, as we learned in the algorithm, the, when a sender wants to send to a group for the first time, um, a tree is built for that particular sender to the group by first flooding the network, right? Each router floods, so we broadcast everyone in the network. Uh, we avoid loops by having each router drop packets, that packet coming in on links that aren't the link that we use to get to the sender. And the resulting tree is trimmed or pruned, right? Everyone prunes themselves who doesn't need to be on the tree. So the people who don't need to be on the tree are people who don't have any children that are in that group. But this problem becomes much easier if you think about the implications and the results of this protocol rather than the steps themselves, especially with a complicated network like this one. Because of the way that we build the tree and avoid loops, the path that a packet takes is always coming in on the link that you would use to reach the sender. So the path from C to H would, is the path that H, uh, that a packet from H would take to reach C. So this path, the shortest path from H to C. And our tree, uh, after being pruned, ends up uh, being made up of just the shortest paths from each member of the group back to the center. So from D, E, F, like that. Um, so the path that the packet from C to H would take would just be that exact path, the shortest path from H to C. So C to B, B to G, G to I, and then I to H. Now armed with this information, part two um, should be easier. So part two asks, does that path change if F joins the group? Well, if the path that a packet takes is the shortest path from that receiver to the sender, adding someone else to our tree, to our group, doesn't affect that path at all. So no, um, having F join doesn't at all, in any case, for DVMRP affect the path that the packet would have taken to get from C to H. OK, so now let's look at core base trees. And I'm going to erase everything that's on our, on our tree here, so it doesn't, on our, on our network here, so it doesn't bother us. In part two, we're using core based trees where B is our initial core. So here's B, our core. Um, suppose J wants, uh, joins the group initially. What path does its join message take? Well, remember with core based trees, to join a group, um, a host just sends a join message to the core. And uh, along the way, Routers mark down, mark themselves, and the link that that message came in on as part of the tree. And this join message goes until it hits some router that's a member of the tree. Because our end goal is to build a tree that spans all of our group members. And so as soon as a uh, join message hits a node that's already part of that tree, uh, then now just those new, new links that have been added up until there are what's needed. Everything else, the, the rest of the path is the same and is already part of the tree. We'll, we'll see what that means in a second. So J, J wants to join the group initially. To join the group, we send a join message to the core. So 
This first packet is going to be first message sent. I'm going to say so join message message one. She wants to join. So J but sent to I. Then that packet goes I to G, and then finally G to B. And every step along the way, G now knows that it's part of this tree. I knows that it's part of this tree. J is obviously part of the tree, and of course, core the core is part of the tree. And each of these nodes knows the links that are included in the tree. So great. So the packet goes, the message goes J, I, G, B. Now five minutes later, H wants to join the group. So join message two. H wants to join. Well, H is going to send a packet to B. But now, so H sends his packet. Um, I is already part of the tree. So as we said before, there's no point in sending this uh, join message further along um, to B because all of these links and nodes on the way to B are already part of the tree because I is. Because someone else joined before. Um, so this join message stops at I. We only get packet sent from H to I, the message sent. Now in part three, D wants to join, which we'll do in green. So join message three. D now wants to join. So D will send a packet to the core to B. D sends to E. E sends to F. F sends to G. And G is already a member of the uh, of the of this tree that we have for this group, so the packet stops there. D, E, F, G. Okay, finally, in part four, we have um, uh, H wanting to send a multicast packet to its group members. So, what path does the message take? Well, this is where the whole beauty of the of core base trees comes in. By building the single tree for the whole uh, for the whole group that spans the whole group. By definition, this tree has no loops. So we can apply the same logic that we applied when we were talking about um, L2 routing, where we had a spanning tree protocol, STP, right? That built a spanning tree at L2 so that uh, we could just flood all of our, and every time we, we get a packet in to reach everyone on the network, you just flood out all of your other uh, links. And because there's it's a tree, there's no loops, so there's um, no problem. That's generally the problem with, with flooding. Right? Packets will loop around and keep getting flooded around the circle. Trees have no loops, so we don't have that problem. And now with a core-based tree, uh, we can do exactly that. So if H wants to um, send to the group, the that packet will just get flooded out all links that are part of that group and every step along the way. So you can do this in orange. We'll say data one. So H wants to send to all the members of the group. H floods um, out all of the, sends on all of the links that are part of the group. I does the same. G does the same. F does the same. E does the same. And so the path that our packet takes is looks a little bit like this. So H, I, G, F, E, D. Except at I, the packet splits off um, and also goes to J. And at G, the packet splits off and also goes to B. So at I and G, it gets duplicated. So let me move my answer down. Now, what if C were the core instead? This would be a really annoying question if C were still in a totally different place in the graph, because then we'd have to rewind all the previous steps. Uh, but we can be a little more efficient here. And notice that um, C is super close to B. So I'll just move this core over here. Uh, C will behave as a core almost exactly the same way that B does, except it's just one more link away. right? The, and this is our new tree. Super simple, because uh, the, because in all the previous steps, H would have had to send to C to join, and that packet would have taken the exact same path on its way to B, and then just taken that extra hop over to C. So the path that's taken by our packet is exactly the same as the previous path, 
except additionally from because C is also part of our of our tree, packet also goes to C.